right. So, let's go over this. What's our slope? Three. Here's slope. What's our derivative? Yeah, so kx squared. K is just the coefficient. If it were like 5x cubed, the derivative would be 15, 3 times 5, x squared. K is just a number, it's a coefficient, so 3 times k. Uh, and then use the x going by 1. So there we got one equation. And maybe you can solve for k over here. So divide the 3s and then divide over the x squared, and you get k equals 1 over x squared, and then you put a wall. So you can come over here. What's f of x? kx to the cube, and what's y? 3x plus 1. Now, we know what k is, sort of. What can we do with this that we know about k? Plug it in. So what this boils down to is you have to know derivatives are slopes and y equals f of x. That's not just applicable here in these random k problems. It's applicable all over the place. It's applicable in the tangent line problem. So what's the equation of the tangent line? Well, the derivative is the slope, and the y-coordinate equals the function at that value for x. So you have to know these things. When in doubt, write these things down and see where that gets you. You're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Maybe derivatives equal slopes, and y equals f of x will help me out. Maybe. Brian, look at the problem. Chris, look at the problem. So I'm going to plug 1 over x squared in here for k. And now you go ahead and solve for x. x to the third over x squared is x. Subtract the x, uh, 3x, uh, that's 1. And then divide by negative 2, so you get negative 1 half. Boom, 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 boom. Bring that back over, now you can solve for k. So 1 over negative 1 half squared. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. 1 divided by 4 is equal to 4. k is 4. Walking around, some people did other methods. Some people had the same setup, but solved for k in both equations. So they had k equals 1 over x squared and k equals 3x plus 1 over x cubed. That's fine. I think it's more complicated, but it works. And then you would set 1 over x squared equal to the thing you got over here for k and solve for x that way. That should work as well, but I think it's a little harder equation to solve. But it works. But what you got to hold on to is derivatives are slopes. And y equals f of x. And again, I can't emphasize this enough, so I'm going to keep saying it. If you don't know what to do in a count problem, with what we've known so far, differential calculus, these two equations, that's what you fall back on. If you don't know, write those down and see where it gets you. Uh, sure. Get out of your homework. Yes, ma'am. I thought you were done with my careers. Uh, I don't know what to do. Like, we'll talk some other time about it. What do we want to look at? 19. Yeah, 19 is a tougher one. And 19, there's a couple ways you can attack it. What was it? Y equals uh, 1 over T minus 3 all squared. Yeah. And 21 was what? Y equals uh, plus. Plus. 23. 23, I cut off the homework. It was on the key, but I did not assign it because that was product rule in tandem with chain rule. And I figured we'd probably be better off holding off on 23. So. Uh, last night I was hoping to just be just pure chain rule. Although 19 is like, if you do it a different way than what's on the key, you can throw both of them in there too. Um, anything else besides 19 and 21? 13. 13. What's 13? 6x squared plus 1. That's it? Yeah. All right. So, uh, let's get forward pointers. Uh, Iman and Rose and Laura. Let's go through that row. The rest is. Look over here at example five. 
And I would recommend you start finding the derivative. I'll call on somebody when we go over this, because you have time right now while they're putting that up to tell us what a derivative is. And uh, my recommendation is start off by rewriting this thing without the radical before you figure out ins and outs. So don't jump right into chain rule. Rewrite this so that there's no radical, and then figure out what's in and what's out. Why did I put the stupid remote? Any comments on 13? I forget. How does the ANSI key express stuff in terms of the work? Does it do ins and outs or does it do something else? Okay, so it's not my key that must be the dog one. But that shows you a different way than what I do. Um, 21. Fine, what's the end? Yeah. And what's the out? That's good. All right. And if you do D out times D in, nobody cares. It's the same thing, so that's fine. Uh, 19 was in the rows. Talk to us. Now, how did you get D in? Okay. 
Yeah. How else could we have gotten dn? If, d, if n is going to be the fraction, what's another way we could have gotten the derivative of the inside part? We could have done the quotient rule. Alternatively, how else could we have rewritten the original to avoid having n be a fraction? So if we want to avoid having n be a fraction, we can do that here. How else can we rewrite this before we even start? T minus 3, so we flip the denominator to just T minus 3, and then what would the exponent be? Negative 2. And then n could just be T minus 3, and that would be n to the negative second power. So there's several ways you could attack this. However you attack it, you should end up here. Uh, any comments to clarify on anything? What's, what's going on with 19? Yes? Oh, yeah, you can have that. Dice, tell me one, two, six. So, Deb and Andre, should those hand it in? All right, so before we can figure out where the derivative is zero and where it doesn't exist, we've got to get the derivative in the first place. So in order to get the derivative, we're going to have to use chain rule. Before we use chain rule, we should write this in a way that is most conducive to chain ruling. And Harnor, how would you rewrite this? All right, x squared minus 1 to the 2 thirds power. That way you avoid having a radical as part of your function. It's just all in exponent form. So when we go to, to differentiate this, what is our inner part, Chris? x squared minus 1. And what's our outer part, Dev? Inside of the power of 2 thirds. So then we can go ahead and differentiate each piece. So when we go and get d in, what's our derivative of the inside part, Akshay? 2 x. And what's the derivative of the outside part uh, Kayla? Two thirds one. Hey, that's a good that's a good cop out. <laughs> I I know I need to subtract 1. I don't remember how to subtract 1, so I'll just say 2 thirds minus 1. That's clever. Uh, what is 2 thirds minus 1? Negative 1 third, please. Make sure you're good at subtracting 1. So you got your d in, d out, mush them together. And you got f prime of x. What do we do with d in and d out? How do we mush them? Multiply them. What's 2x times 2 thirds? 4x over 3. Where are we going to put in? in the bottom. What is in? And what is it raised to? The one third. So that's your derivative. Ta -da. So that's step one. So even before you can start actually answering the prompt, hey, where's the derivative zero? Where does it not exist? You need to first of all get the derivative. So do your chain rule. Done. Any comments, questions, queries, concerns about this? Yes. Yep. It means you need to find all of the points, so all of your x, y coordinate combinations, where the derivative is zero, and then also find all of the points, those are x, y combinations, where the derivative does not exist, because it's undefined. 
So let's find when the derivative is 0. We take the derivative, and what do we do with it? Set it equal to 0. All right, that makes sense. So you say, all right, let's do 4x over 3 quantity x squared minus 1 to the 1 third equals 0. How do we solve that ugly looking equation? Ahmed. Multiply the denominator to the other side. So multiply both sides by the denominator. That cancels out the denominator on the left. And you're left with what on the left? 4x. You multiply the denominator on the right. And what do you have on the right? 0. Because 0 is great. It kills everybody. So what is your solution for x? 0. Ba -ba -ba. Is that our answer? No. Because we also need y. Because we have a point. Not just the x coordinate. We want the point. So to find our y coordinate, y is going to equal what? F, f of x. So y equals f of 0. So y equals f of x. x is 0. So y equals f of 0. Go ahead and plug 0 into your function. What 0 squared minus 1? Now let's do it over here. What's 0 squared minus 1? Negative 1 squared is? Cube root of 1 is? So y equals 1. So the point is 0, 1. Why am I holding it? Um, so now you know derivative equals 0 at this point, 0, 1. What would that mean about our tangent line? It's flat. We, what do we call a flat line? Horizontal. So this is where our tangent line is horizontal. Moving on, when does the derivative not exist? So let's look at your derivative. How do we know when an expression is undefined, say? The denominator is equal to 0. So f prime doesn't exist if denominator equals 0. So you take the denominator of the derivative, 3 quantity x squared minus 1 to the 1 third, and you say, hey, you denominator, b0. And now you solve that for x. Um, so in order to solve this, what might our first step be? Multiply or divide over the 3. And we'd have x squared minus 1 equals 0 still. Oh, wait, I forgot the 1 third power. Now how do we kill the exponent? Cube both sides. So that's a cube root. We kill a root with an exponent. So we cube both sides. And that gives us x squared minus 1 is set free. And what's 0 cubed? Still 0. So then we can solve this. And what are your solutions going to be for x? Plus or minus 1. So you can factor that and solve it. Or you can add the 1 and square root and solve it. But in any case, you should get plus or minus 1 for your solutions. So that's going to be the x values where the derivative does not exist. Because these x values, if you plug them into the derivative, make 0 in the denominator. Any questions with setting this up, why we're doing this, and how we got there? Prince. Correct. So that's where the derivative is undefined. Risa? We do, because it says find the points. So the derivative doesn't exist. That doesn't mean the point doesn't exist. The point very well could exist, right? Chris, get off the phone. Lucas, kill the phone. So we still got to find out what's our y coordinate, what's y equals f of 1, what's y equals f of negative 1. So go back into the original function. If you plug in 1 to the function, what do you get back for y? 0. So your point is 1 comma 0. If you plug negative 1 into the function, what do you get back for y? 0. So y equals 0, negative 1 comma 0. So you have two points on the curve. They exist on the curve, but the derivative doesn't exist because in the derivative you get division by 0 at those x values. Follow-up comments on that?
All right, example six is going back to, here's a function, get the derivative, and see if we can avoid doing more rules than necessary. So we have g of t equals 7 over 2t minus 3 cubed. So with this sort of thing, we have options about how we can attack this. What's one option that we could do? Quotient rule, right? Now, if we're going to do, like, obviously it's a fraction, so quotient rule is always an option with fractions. If we were going to do quotient rule, what would have to happen first? You have to shoot it at the denominator. You want to shoot it at anything to the third power? Probably not. So quotient rule is an option, but it's not a nice one. Um, you could do chain rule, and then there's a couple ways you could go about doing chain rule. You could just jump right in. If we jump right into chain rule, what's our inner part? 2t minus 3. And then what's our outer part? 7 over into the third power. And then to deal with the outside part, how do we have to rewrite this before we differentiate? Yeah, bring up the in. So it's 7 times in to the what? Negative third. So that's a totally reasonable way to do it, and it's not that bad. Yep, you're right. That's out, not in. The out, not in. Is that what you're going to say? Sorry. Thank you. Um, now, there's another way to do this, and that would be to do this kind of rewriting step at the beginning, and then define in and out. So if you wanted to, you could say this is 7 times all of that stuff, the negative third. Um, I don't know if there's one way that's better than the other. I think what we have already is probably the most obvious way to attack this, so that's probably what I would do. But the book recommends doing this instead. And then out is just in the, uh, 7 into the negative third, which ends up basically being the same thing. All right. So in any case, in is 2t minus 3, out is 7 over n cubed, or 7 times n to the negative 3. It's the same thing, depending on whether you kind of do your rewrite step at the beginning or within your out stuff. Go ahead and finish this off. Yes, sir. Correct. Correct. When the curve goes vertical. So if the curve is one of these things, at this point, the derivative would not exist. So the derivative doesn't exist with sharp turns. The derivative does not exist at discontinuities. Or, or, 
So sharp turns, places where the curve is momentarily vertical. So like instead of going flat, it goes vertical. And places where you have a discontinuity. So that's where you have no derivative. Um, on these first two situations, you at least have a point in the curve. At these situations, you may or may not have a point in the curve because of the discontinuity. That answer your question. All right. So, D in. Sabia, what's D in? Muhammad, what's D in? Two. All right. And then D out. Arnor, what do we get for D out? Into the fourth. All right. So negative 21 times into the negative four, or negative 21 over into the four. And then once we've got these, put them together. And what's our G prime equation, Tanika? Negative 42 over 2t minus 3. Beautiful. So multiply d in and d out. 2 times 21 is 42. It's over the in stuff. It's 2t minus 3. All over 4. There's your derivative. Um, so that covers what I would call our basic situations where it's this is a problem to do just chain rule. And it's just chain rule, not in combination with anything else other than power rule, which is always a ball. Um, but we're not using chain rule in combination with product or quotient rule that we have so far. Any questions with that? Now, example seven, eight, and nine, things get much worse real fast. So, uh, example seven, we have a chain rule. We know we have a chain rule because we look at the square root and we say, ew, stuff inside a square root is not just x. It's square root of messiness. So that's going to require chain rule. But what else is there besides the square root? Product rule, because we have x squared times the square root. So have your eyes open. It's really easy to miss product rule when you get focused in on chain rule. It's less easy to miss quotient rule, because the fraction kind of like reaches out and slaps you in the face. I'm a fraction. Uh, but it's easy to just kind of look right past product rule and not notice that. So, hey, we got this extra x squared outside the square root. These are multiplying, so that has to be product rule. It's not like over here where the thing was just a constant. If that were just a constant, this is 5 square root, then we could get away with not doing product rule. Because that's not a constant, the x squared is a variable part. We're going to have to use our product rule in combination with uh, our chain rule. Hi, Ms. Barnes. So go ahead and say, what's our product rule? Well, first of all, for product rule, what do we label things? One and two. So there's one, there's two. What does product rule say we have to do? First times the second plus. Second times d first, or d first times second. I always do one then two. Some people always do the original then the derivative. It doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter with multiplication or with adding. So if you have this like all jumbled, as long as you have derivative of the one times the other, and then you swap that, you're cool. So what's your first function? X squared. Derivative of the second. What do we have to do? Chain. All right, I'm just going to write the word chain there and come back to it. Derivative of the first, what is he? 2x. Original second, what is he? So we've got x squared times derivative of the second. That's messy, so we'll go off in the margin and find the derivative of the second somewhere else. And then we have derivative of the first is 2x times the original second is the square root of 1 uh, minus x squared. So do you guys have any questions with setting this up as, at heart, this is a product rule problem, but then hiding in there, you have to do some change. So any questions with just this setup? Now let's go over to this side and say, all right, let's get derivative of the second over here. So if we're doing the derivative of the second, what's the inner part? 
or minus x squared. What's the out? Into the one half, because it's not in the bottom of the bracket. What's d in? Negative two x. What's d out? One over two into the one half, which is really one over two x squared minus one over one half. So we've got the in, we got the out. So what's d in times the out? Oh, it's one minus x squared. Thank you, Rose. So that's not, not minus one, it's one. One minus x squared. So I owe Lisa and the Rose. All right. So when we put this all together, what's the derivative of the second part? Great. So the in times the out, the twos cancel, and we're left with negative x over the decimals. Um, so you can then take this and say, let's put it back over here for what we got with the derivative of the second. And now we can finish off our product here. So these things where you're doing chain rule in combination with something else, they get tedious. There's a lot of moving parts. So labeling stuff, I think, is super very helpful to keep track of all the different pieces. And having stuff well, nicely organized, and you look at this and say, nicely organized? Okay, sorry. But try to have things organized in a systematic way so that you know where everything is and what things are and label things clearly so that you can keep track of stuff. So now that you do this, what's x squared times negative x? Negative x cubed. So this together will be negative x to the third over 1 minus x squared to the 1 half plus 2x to the square root of 1 minus x squared. Do we like this the way it is? Yeah, I like it fine. But if you don't, you could combine these into a single bracket. I, I see, I have no strong desire to do that, but you're welcome to if you want. Um, any follow up on example seven? Yes. I'm sure there's another message. So this is the least painful way to do it. Uh, you can always just flip something to produce a negative exponent and make the quotient instead. I don't think you want to do that though. Yes. Oh, so when we do d in times d out, negative two over two cancel. Negative x times one on top. You see that now? All right. Any other details or big picture things? There's a lot going on, so if you need another second to digest that, that's fine. Example eight. This is chain in combination with quotient rule. Now, um, there's really only one way of doing chain and product rule. Well, that's probably not true, but it's mostly a product rule with chain hiding inside of it. Unfortunately, quotient rule and chain rule can combine in two different ways. We can have a quotient rule problem with chain hiding inside, or you can have a chain rule problem where a quotient's inside. So it's basically, um, who's the inside part? Is the inside part the fraction, and then something's happening to the large fraction? Or do you have a fraction, and then something messy is inside the fraction? Uh, and that's what we have here. We have a big fraction, and then inside that fraction is something messy. So this is at heart a quotient rule problem, where you're going to have chain rule happening inside of it. Before you start this, if 
might be helpful to rewrite the denominator as x squared plus 4 to the 1. One third. So I think a general rule of thumb is if you have to do a derivative and you see a radical, rewrite it without the radical, turn the radical into an exponent. You could rewrite this again, bring the radical up, and make it x plus 4 to the negative one third and do product rule again. But I don't know if that's really any better than what we're about to do with quotient. So at heart, this is a quotient rule problem, because at heart, this is a basic fraction. Unfortunately, the denominator is messy, so the denominator will require changing. So f prime of x, before we jump into doing quotient rule, let's just remind ourselves what is quotient rule. Low d high, minus high d low, over low low. So let's just jump right in the same way we did over here with the product rule. Let's start filling in what we know, and then if we get to something that is going to require chain rule, we'll come over in the margin and do the chain rule over in the margin, and then fill that back in. So what's low? Do we know what low is? Yeah, the cube root thing. So low is x squared plus 4 to the 1 third. What's d high? 1 times 1. I'm not going to write it. Minus. I. What's high? X. All right. We're off to a good start. And what's D low? That's math. That's messy. That's chain. So I'm just going to write chain in there for right now. And we'll come off to the side and do D low over here. Now let's go ahead and finish fleshing out our fraction before we come over and do that. What's low low? The mess, but now raised to what power? To two thirds. So if you have a something to some power and then you square that, you just double the exponent. So now it's x squared plus 4 to the two thirds. So we just got to figure out okay, what's going here for d low with our chain rule? So we come over here and we're doing d low, what is our inner part? And what is the derivative of that? 2x. What's the outer part? 10 to the 1 third. What's the derivative of that? 1 over 3 and then into the negative 2 thirds. Now you're like, why don't we throw that down the stairs with the 3 and make the exponent positive? Uh, because then we'll have a fraction within the numerator, which we'd like to avoid. So this is going to get pretty messy. So d low is d in times d out here. So what do we get? For d in times d out. 2x over 3 times plus 4, negative 2 thirds. That's d low. And go back and put that back into your fraction for your quotient rule. Yeah. Good news. This is like the worst case scenario. I don't I don't think we can really make things worse than we've done. Well, we probably can make the numerator also terrible, but Let's not do that. Laura? And then just call it a day? No, because we don't like negative exponents. So our bigotry against negative exponents comes back to bite us now. So we've got x squared plus 4 to the 1 third minus what's x times 2x? That's 2x squared over 3 times x squared plus 4 to the negative 2 thirds, and then over x squared plus 4 to the 2 thirds. And now we said we don't like fractions in the numerator, and we don't like having negative exponents. So now we have to try to kill those things. Um, and the way we're going to do that is multiply by cancel. 
uh, this gets getting better and better. The next one is not nearly as bad, I promise. So let's first off kill off the three. What do we need to do to kill off this three in the bottom of this mini track? Multiply by three. All right, hey, that's not so bad. And then we also want to kill off this x squared plus four to the negative two thirds. So we should multiply by some amount of x squared plus four, maybe to the what power? How about the positive two thirds? So if you want to kill off a negative exponent by multiplying with fancy one, just multiply by the positive version of that exponent. So x squared plus four to the positive two thirds will cancel out x squared plus four to the negative two thirds. So you're going to multiply by a 3 and an x squared plus 4 to the 2 thirds. Akshay. Why am I multiplying the x squared plus 4? To make the negative exponent disappear from the numerator. We don't like negative exponents. So this thing has a negative exponent, so we multiply by that thing to the positive exponent of the same number. So down here? Yeah, just without. I wish. Raising it down. I, I, I wish we could. The problem with doing that is that do these are these things dividing the first term of the numerator? No. No. And if we do that, then we'll be turning subtraction into division. And you're not allowed to do that. You can turn multiplication into division and vice versa, but not adding or subtracting into division. So, um, that's that's a common mistake people always want to do. People always want to say, oh, the easy way out is to put, bop, put this stuff in the denominator and just kind of like totally ignore the fact that now this thing that previously was not being divided by 3 or x squared plus 4 now is. That's unfortunately the way it is. So we're not allowed to do illegal things. I wish we could, but too bad. So when we multiply this out, what's 3? times this thing, well, that, that, let me rephrase. What happens when you multiply the x squared plus 4 to the 2 thirds and the x squared plus 4 to the 1 third? So what would we do with the exponents? Add them, what's 1 third plus 2 thirds? 1, so this is just x squared plus 4. And we have a 3 in front of it, so 3 quantity x squared plus 4. So these multiply, add the exponents, it's 1. So it's just x squared plus 4 to the 1. Here's the exponent. And the 3 comes along for the ride. 3. Then you multiply this whole thing with the second term of the numerator. What's 2x squared over 3 times 3? 2x squared. And what's x squared plus 4 to the negative 2 thirds times x squared plus 4 to the positive 2 thirds? It cancels out. That's why we multiplied by x squared plus 4 to 2 thirds. We knew that that would cancel this term out. So this is just 2x squared. Hooray! In the denominator, we have a 3. And then we have an x squared plus 4 to the how much? 4 thirds. Because 2 thirds and 2 thirds make 4 thirds. And then finally, you can clean up the numerator now pretty easily. Because you have 3 combined by terms. But if you're like, nah, I'm done, okay, fine. If you've gotten to this point, you clearly know what you're doing. Prince. Yeah, so if you look at this and say, doing quotient rule and chain rule together like this sucks. Let's just avoid that and do product rule instead because, I mean, this also sucked, but it sucked a little bit less. That was one of the best notes I ever got from a student. Math sucks, but you make it suck a little bit less. Oh, that warmed my heart. So <laughs> I saved that note. It's in the back office. So, so yeah, you could bring that up, make an x squared plus 4 to the negative 1 third times x, and then you could do product rule. Um, I suppose maybe it's marginally better than doing this. Lucas? Uh, would we get something like this bad? Only if it pissed me off. Cool. Not pissed me off. Grace? Um, so you would say we have like if it were the other way around. I'm so glad you asked. Look over here at example nine. 
Exactly. Whatever this is. Oh, you do it. See, I told you it was example nine. Ha. Huh. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, can't write. So this is also clearly chain and quotient because you have a fraction involved with something inside of something. Uh, in my opinion, this is less obnoxious than what we just did. So when you have the fraction and the whole fraction is inside and getting raised to some power, it's not so bad, um, I think. What's your inner part? So 3x minus 1 over x squared plus 3. And then your outer part is in cube. So this is a lot easier setup than the other way. This is, you got the big fraction getting raised to some power. So we have a clear inner part. The inner part is the whole fraction. The outer part is that whole thing Q. To get D in, what do we have to do? Quotient rule. So for this, we'll do our quotient rule. And then that'll give you some new fraction. And you multiply that by D out. What's D out? 3 times n squared. So you have 3 times your original fraction squared. This is, as far as quotient rules go, not that bad. So you do your quotient rule over here, you get some fraction, and then you do big ugly fraction times three times big ugly fraction, and you call it a day. And maybe you say, oh, I have an x squared plus three squared on the denominator and an x squared plus three squared on the denominator, and you can combine things with just like sticking the factors in the numerator all next to each other. And you have x squared plus 3 all to the 4. Um, so you have homework tonight. More practice with just finding derivatives, using chain rule, and maybe in combination with something else. That's over the weekend. Next week, I'm hoping for quiz on Wednesday at the earliest and Thursday at the latest. So Wednesday and Thursday is a quiz. And don't forget your delta maths. They're due on Monday morning for the ones for this week. So uh, don't forget to do those or you get a zero. And that would suck. Well, let me stop the recording.